Well, hello and uh, welcome to that favorite part of the day. You should be uh, sat back at home by now, uh, relaxing and uh, waiting for the topic and the in-depth discussions that follow. And today we are looking at governance easier outside than in. You know, when you are in opposition and you are coming into government, I mean, it's just like sitting in your front room and driving. You hardly get an accident. No, if you're in your bedroom and you're weeding, there's not a chance you get pricked by any wood or any thorn. You can do it. But once you're actually on the farm or once you're actually behind the steering wheel, it's a different story. And lo and behold, uh, you know, the wheels of government have changed into a different party and it's reality setting home. President has uh, made his political suicide statement to say, you know what, putting my presidency on the line to clear Galamse, if it costs my presidency, so be it. DCs are out there, you know, having the orientation before they hit the offices and start working. Uh, what happens next? Because next year, DCs are going to, well, DCs are supposed to to you know, enter into a full-blown elections and then what then happens to all these guys who have been oriented? Do they run for elections? Do they get out? There's a lot happening in governance and therefore we need someone in governance to educate us. But with all these change that we are seeking, can this change happen on the same laws that we are working with or should changes be made in the law to make the change happen? Who knows? My name is Anand Sakwa, the fourth chief of the Little Republic of Akwamu Edumasa. When I come talking to somebody who understands governance, then go. Thank you very much for staying. Governance, easier outside than in. With me in studio is Dr. Eric Odrew Osain, he's a political analyst, he's a lawyer, and a governance expert, so he understands what's happening. Doc, thank you very much and welcome. Is it Happy New Year? Yeah, it's Happy New Year. Happy New Year. <laughs> Can you imagine? Yeah. Uh, it's July and I have to wish Doc a Happy New Year. Definitely. Your Amban Temusa is now wiped off. You have to get a whole fresh bottle of Amban Temusa. Thank you, Nana. I'll make it available. <laughs> uh, Doc, is governance, you know, easier outside than in? Thank you very much for the question. I'll say good evening to our viewers. I would agree with you that gov governance is easier outside than inside because of the unknown factors. Mm. Uh, because experience tells us that you come face to face with certain challenges when you are in the driving seat. Um, because of the principle of selective sharing of information, it makes it difficult for people outside government to know what exactly governance entails. All they can do is to pe speculate and make a lot of assumptions. If you make assumptions, there are rooms for errors to be committed, or there is a margin of error to be committed. So the strategy is when you come into governance, you work towards reducing the margin of error, but you cannot hit the ground running as if you have been in governance. So some margin of error is allowable. But you see, uh, it's not allowable. Why do I say that? Because I mean, most, I mean, in, in our case, you know, we run a two-party system. So it's, you know, MPP in power, then it's NDC in power, then it's MPP in power. And you've been there before. Uh, some of the people running were ministers. You know, in our case, you have something like, you know, the vice president who come from the central bank. So they, they're not just talking. Out. They, 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 they know what they are talking about. Uh, so when you are making promises, I mean, you should probably go back and recollect and say, look, in my time, this quantum of money wasn't there or that law was preventing us and therefore I can't make this promise. So when you come in and say, ah, I did not realize, is it forgivable? To some extent, it's forgivable, uh, to some extent. No, no, because, you see, baseline is very important. And if you are in a country where statistics are very scarce, relevant statistics are very scarce, you get institutions giving out reports. But then when you come to government, you need to also validate that report. And then you come face to face with the evidence. I'm not holding brief for the current government. Well, but what I'm saying is that 
It is easier said than done. When you are outside government, you think all is rosy. When you come into governance, you will come face to face with the realities. But that is why you are there. That is why you are elected into office. So that when you come face to face with the realities, the strategies you put in place will tell us whether you are a better leader than the person there or not. I, I would you know, just, just, just a lot of point, then I'll move on. With regards to reducing electricity, uh, reducing electricity tariffs, you know, one of the campaign messages are look, electricity is now costing more than our rent and everything. And then when the government changed, the party then realized that, listen, there's a 2.5 billion deficit that I need to cover, and therefore electricity will still be higher than your rent because I won't be able to reduce it in, in, in any way. I mean, are they saying there was no way they could have known that, listen, there's a pile-up of debts that have to be recovered, and therefore if I'm making promises, are there no promise along that line because I won't be able to fulfill it? Well, they should have known. They should have known. But I also say that there's nothing wrong coming back to renegotiate with the citizens. This is a social contract, mm. and that is the mark of a good leader. Mm. You tell the people the truth, the realities on the ground. I did not know A, B, C, D when I was in opposition. Now I know it. I want to revise my notes. I want to revise the social contract with you. I'm bent on delivering on my promise, but these are the hindrances, and I need you to support me in that regard. If our leaders will be that open and transparent with us, I want to believe that citizens would also agree with them and support them to achieve a genuine cause. After all, they made some of the statements when they were not in governance. Now they are in governance or government. They've come face to face with the realities. They have to revise their notes. So you need to come back to the citizens. There's nothing wrong with that. You're taking us for a ride. Because then it means that I can say anything, get me in power, and then when I come into power, I say, ah, that's it, you know. Forget about the free loaves of bread I was going to give you, the snow flour. Well, forget about the sandals I was going to give you. I don't have leather. Well, forget about the road I was going to do you. I don't have bitumen. You know, so then everybody will just come, you know, promise high heavens and then tell you, well, I haven't got a ladder to climb up to heaven, so I can't go with you. There should be some checks and balances to say, listen, you said A, and you cannot come back and tell me that. I mean, so, so on, on what basis were you making that promise? I was coming to that because baseline is very important. That is why in a democratic development, we should have an institution that will support the various political parties in the development of their party manifestos. That will conduct very good evidence-based research to support the campaign promises they make. And then that would also support them in the formulation of the entire manifesto promises. Mm -hmm. But I was asking myself that of all the political parties, how many of them did stakeholder consultation nationwide to consult people to validate some of the promises they were making? You know, most of them did not do that just because we don't have the framework. So I think that, yes, some people can make political promises, but I'm sure that they should have some evidential basis to making those promises. But if you have a particular evidence or a particular information at the time of making the promise, and you come to government, and you come to face another or different type of evidence, nothing prevents you from weighing the two and telling the society or the electorate that, look, before, when I made this promise, this was the situation I was given. Now I am in government. This is the current situation in which I find myself. This is the ideal way to go for development to happen in Ghana. There's nothing wrong with that. But I think that in most cases, some of the leaders, uh, they, 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 they don't come out with the hard truth. Truth is bitter. But when you lay it bare, all of us are prepared to support the process. In all our churches, if the church leadership comes to tell you that the coffers are dry, we need to organize a certain offering to be able to uh, ensure that we, 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 we put something in the mm -hmm. coffers. People will bring the money. You even get one person getting up to say, that, how much do you need? The person will pay. Ghanaians want leaders who will tell them the truth. And if they tell them the truth and they go according to their promises, Ghanaians are prepared. Why not to support the process? On the subject of truth, you know, uh, the president made a you know, very passionate appeal. You know, pro I think he spoke even ex tempo. I don't think he was reading from anything. Uh, you know, appealing to chiefs, appealing to the nation, government, everyone that, listen, this generation owes it to the generation ahead and that the environment, we cannot destroy it. We need to preserve the environment for future use. And uh, he said that cabinet, you know, some people have warned that, listen, these guys will vote against us and this. And he, he said, listen, if that's what's going to take to get me out of power, then that's what it is. But the choices I have to make 
I have to choose the right one rather than the one that would vote me into power. I mean, is that a politically wise statement or is that a political suicide statement? See, I have always said that we need a leader who will say that I will do the right thing and then rule Ghana for only four years. Mm. Rather than doing that, which is acceptable to people. Because in politics, most politicians have this belief that in politics, you do that which is acceptable, not that which is right. Mm -hmm. Because if you do that which is right, you will lose the next elections. So they will end up doing that which is acceptable, which will please the people. No, that is not the right thing to do. So I want a leader, I'm looking forward to a leader who would say that I will do that which is right, make sure Ghana develops. If I'm, I'm retained in office for only four years, and I don't, I, I'm not voted into office for the next four years, I like it. And that's the kind of statement the president has made. It's very important he goes by that, because sustainable utilization of resources is very important. And that is central to sustainable development. And democracy without sustainable development is meaningless, because you cut it short somewhere. We need to make sure that we sustain the utilization of resources through very good environmental management so that sustainable development can, uh, can happen in Ghana. You know, so I, I want to believe it may be in part political statement. On the other hand, I also want to believe that he means what he's saying because he knows how it can cost him if he goes all out to ensure that we manage our environment well. But that is the kind of leadership we need. I've always been saying that we have copied democracy blindly. Mm. Africa, we need African type of democracy. That would bring, uh, give us the kinds of leaders that would understand the nature of our society mm -hmm. and provide that kind of leadership that will introduce some level of catalytic development in our society. Mm. We, we are not there yet because we have a society where a majority, excuse me to say, are illiterate. Majority do not understand the implications of our laws. Our laws are also in technical English language that people will not understand. Yet we want to practice a type of democracy that is practiced by a Western or developed countries where about 80% of the society can read and write and they understand the implications of their laws. Look at the disconnect. So it's about time we evolve the African type of democracy. But then we need that kind of leadership that will be trustworthy. The leader that would say that I will do that which is right, not that which is acceptable. It's still political expediency. And rather consider development as a number one priority. If that leader is able to come in this day and age, we'll be able to see rapid development in Ghana. I mean, but won't, with the sort of politics that we run, the opposition then is going to probably latch on to it and say, well, that's it. You go ahead and get voted out. When we come, we're not going to make that mistake. We're just going to open the floodgates again. You see, that's what makes the leader then backs down at the end. Because, you know, former President Mahama said, look, I was going to pay allowances to teachers and nurses. Look, yeah. everybody, if you want to be a teacher, if you want to be a nurse, you go to the school. Because if I do the allowances, I'm limiting you. If I don't, it's every, you know... But just a few days to the election, there were cash on tables and people queuing up, come and take the money, come and take the money. Even though by then, you know, people were so disheartened, they took the money and still voted against. I mean, is this is the same thing going to happen somewhere here? Where you say, well, it's okay, you know, go and dig your, go and do your galaxy, just don't go near the rivers, you know, just... I, I don't see that happening. If, I, if it's happening, it happens. It will be politically suicidal for them because now, both the opposition and the government in party have bought into it. And I like the media's approach. The media has also bought into it. And Nananom has also bought into it that, look, enough is enough. Mm. Galamse must end now. Not only Galamse, any form of environmental degradation must end now. So Ghanaians have bought into it. So if they backtrack on this particular issue, it can cost them the next election. No, no, but you see, by now, I'm sure political leadership will be looking to ask probably in the media for support because uh, just like this girl I'm saying, I mean, he, I mean you know, even the minister was making statements like, oh, uh, you know, I'm looking to the media for support. I mean, they, sometimes they become so helpless. helpless. They know what is right, but they dare not move. So it's like, please agitate so mm -hmm. that I can, I, can, I can ride on that wave. Uh, do you think on a statement like this, they will be looking at us for us to say, well, well done, go ahead, well done, so they can move? No, no, you see, they are, they are being reasonable. They are being reasonable because they are first and foremost politicians. Mm. And it's the policy that has brought them to where they are. They may want to do that which is right, but they are, they are, that part of their political wisdom is telling them that you have to hasten slowly. 
So it gets to a point in time where they need the support of a, 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 a vibrant group like the media and the entire society so that they will say that, well, I, I would have wished to do that which is acceptable. But then for the pressure from the media and the others, I'm compelled to do that which is right. Mm. In that case, uh, they are, they, their followers would agree with them. You know? So they, they, they sort of want to find a comfortable place or a face to hide behind, <laughs> as it were. They have been reasonable. Whichever way we look at it, it is good now they have come to accept that it is not the right thing to do. Mm. And in the, for the purpose of Galamse, they are saying, I'll do that which is acceptable. Uh, which is right, not that which is acceptable. And I like it. In fact, if we can approach national issues in all these cases, or national issues in all, along these lines, right. at every point in time, a minister or a politician will say that because the media will chastise me, because the media is backing it, I'll do that which is right, Ghana will develop. Wow. But you see, the, 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 the reality on the ground is alternatives. I know when somebody's breaking the law, you know, it's not up to you to say, well, because you're breaking the law, come and let me give you uh, a law-abiding job. It doesn't become your responsibility. But when the state sits back and thousands and hundreds of thousands engage in this illegality and we haven't stopped it, the onus now falls back on the states to say, look, once you've cleared these people, either I give them a skill or direct them somewhere because it, it has now become the state's responsibility. So, I mean, without alternatives, that's, that's a... You see, the, the Galamse issue requires to be managed well and managed carefully, else its um, social repercussions will be disastrous. Mm. I agree that we should end Galamse now, mm. but end Galamse now and do what? People must know that there's a difference between illegal mining and legal small-scale mining. Mm. So what we can do as a nation is end Galamse, but then put in place a short to medium-term strategy of supporting them to convert their operations into small-scale mining. And then if government can have a way of even supporting the small-scale miners to form them, themselves into bigger mining firms so that at least they will also be able to compete with other foreign BF mining firms in this country, that would help. You know? So I, I think they should use that um, two-point approach. Mm -hmm. If you say that you are ending it now, then what it means is that you are putting other people on the street to do other things because they may they may want to find alternative means of livelihood for themselves you know so as part of our social protection system we need to develop something like that so i don't expect them to end it and leave the people like that you end it develop the short to medium term strategy of supporting them to convert their activities into legal small scale mining or those who are already operating as small-scale miners, support them to come together into a joint venture to form bigger mining firms so that they will also be operating. You, they, they, anybody who will say that small-scale miners are not contributing to the socioeconomic development of this country is lying. But when you look at the statistics, it is there. So if we are able to support them to do it well... It, it's, a, it's a negative contribution where, yes, they are putting something in, but the distraction they are causing behind... Uh, what they're putting is not even enough to go back to repair what they're doing. But, dog, you see, the reality, I'm listening to you, and yeah. the reality is, at the best of times, we are creating 5,000 jobs a year. Mm. At the best of times. So, with all these people out there, unskilled, most of them unskilled, mm -hmm. they've just managed to learn how to use the chamfang and the tutu. Mm. They are not prepared to go and plant corn and wait for six, three months for it to dry and, you know, husky and dry it. They used to get in 2,000 cities a week. So, I mean, that's a huge challenge that we have on our hands. What are you going to scale them with? Where are you going to direct their energies to? And who is going to create even that job for them to go and do? I mean, that's, I mean, everybody says one district, one factory, one district. I mean, how many factory hands can one factory hire? You take somewhere like ATL, which is, a big factory. At the moment, I think there's only like 1,500 people working there. And that's a huge factory. So, <laughs> you see, that, that's what I'm saying, that it, it all boils down to strategy. Um, we have other bigger mining firms working in this country. Uh, we can have a way of um, entering into an arrangement with them to absorb these people. That is, if, if the skills they have is of relevance to the mining firms. But we should be able to prepare them for that particular absorption mm -hmm. to take place. Whichever way we look at it, it is too suicidal for us to leave them on the streets. Mm -hmm. If we leave them on the streets, then we should prepare for another 
uh, another disaster. They'll, the they'll be mining somewhere else. Other, well, they'll, other, be, other than they'll be doing their night mining. <laughs> and you can, you can be sure what will happen to you and I. Okay, yeah. I'm going to take a quick break here. And when I come back, what I want to find out is I know uh, the DCs are just going through their orientation. But meanwhile, during the, one of the campaign promises was that by 2018 June, uh, DCs will be elected. However, you know, July 2017, they're going through an orientation. So what, after one year, it's all back to, you know, ground zero. The rules are going to change. That's going to be a whole different dimension. And I know Doc will educate us on that. You don't want to move. Governance is definitely easier outside than it is when you are inside. Now that you are inside, uh, well, the NPP promised that uh, district uh, elections, you know, well, district DCs, you know, will go through a normal election rather than the president sitting in Flagstaff House and people lobbying, well, put him there, he helped us, he helped us so that people within the community will put themselves up, the community themselves will know who is capable, who would help them, and then they will vote. However, the laws and stuff are there that allows the president to you know, nominate people rather than people just you know, putting themselves up. Doc, I mean, well, I spoke to you this morning, and said, look, it's six months down the line, and DCs are now going through an orientation, and you said, look, now that's quite, quite quick. You know, six months is not bad, so you don't have to complain. I mean, uh, most DCs have even taken longer. Okay. Which, I mean, I'll come back to that, but I mean, if six months, you're now doing your orientation, the last six months of the four years, you definitely be in active campaign, so it gives the DC three solid years to now run the office. One year is completely lost. But we'll come back to timing. But we're just looking at, you know, in, in 2018, you know, we should be going to the ballot box again to elect our DCs. How does that work? Now DCs are going through the orientation to go and start working. After one year, they hit the road that if you want to run for an election. How, how's it going to work? Well, no, no, you see, um with the current arrangement, the president has no option than to go by the existing law. That's under Article 243 mm -hmm. of the Constitution, which requires the president to nominate persons to represent him, to represent the government at the local government level, after they've gone through to test approval of their respective assemblies. But the party also, during campaigning, I made the promise that they're going to elect chief executive. What it then means is that we have to amend our law, we have to review our laws to make this happen. Because the laws as they are now do not really support election of chief executive. But there is one important policy decision the government needs to take. Whether or not this election, direct election, is going to be on partisan basis or non-partisan basis. At the moment, assembly members are expected to put themselves up on non-partisan basis. So if you want to follow that line, then what it then means is that they just have to use their numbers in parliament to amend Article 243 of the Constitution mm -hmm. and Section 20 of the Local Governance Act 936. That is an easier route to go. But then if we want to elect chief executive on partisan basis, then it goes beyond that because it will require a referendum to be undertaken. Because in our Local Governance Act and in the Constitution, all forms of elections at the local government level is expected to be non-partisan. Mm -hmm. Once you introduce partisanship into it, whether for the political leadership, chief executive, or the assembly member, you have to amend the constitution, you know, and you go through a referendum. And when you look at the time space, you'll be able to go through the referendum. But after the referendum, the feedback from the referendum should fit into amendment of the laws. And when the laws are amended, you need to sensitize people before you come to implementation. So with all intent and purpose, if we don't start now, it will be extremely difficult for us to see DCs being elected within the shortest possible time. Mm. That is, if, if, if we don't start now. But if we start now, we'll be able to do that. And if we are able to do that, what is then going to mean is that those who are currently in place, those who have been appointed, will then have to transit and then put themselves up for elections mm -hmm. when the time is due for chief executive to be elected. But whether or not they will get the nod will depend on how they have performed within this period. And I want to believe that when the laws are amended, they are going to put in place transitional arrangements that would allow the current system to, or the people leading the current system to transit 
into the new arrangement. You know, so it is it, it's a matter of law, it's a matter of policy. But the most important decision the government needs to take now is whether or not they are going to do election of DCs on partisan or non-partisan basis. So let's, let's look at this, uh, the differences between partisan and non-partisan non-partisan non basis. But I mean, we say assembly elections shouldn't be, you know, but they are all, they are all very very the partisan. And, yeah, and that yeah. So non-partisan basis, then we are all just being hypocrites. So. Then ideally is to go partisan, you know, just full blown partisan. But then it means we have to change the law. We have to amend the constitution. We have to amend Article Two Twenty. But before the amendment takes place, we have to go through a referendum. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But when you look at the constitution, and, it's clear. And if it's non-partisan, then it means everybody is open for. If it is non-partisan, then everybody can put him or herself up for election. So what is then going to happen is that you can have about a thousand people from a particular district assembly putting themselves up to become chief executive, and you cannot disqualify them unless they are not of age 18 years, unless they have not paid up their taxes, unless they have a criminal record that prevents them from contesting the election. You cannot disqualify them. What it then means is that you give the electoral commission a lot of work to do because you're then going to have a ballot paper that can have about a thousand names on it and people will have to vote. And if, uh, if that one too, it means first pass the post. If, so somebody can then use two votes to win an election to become a mayor or a chief executive. So that is the disadvantage. But the advantage there is that you give everyone the opportunity. Hmm. Is there, is there, there's no way you can... I don't know, limit it? Uh, I don't know. You, see, once you can limit it, but once you introduce a qualification or a criteria in there, the human rights lawyers will come in and say that you are fringing on my fundamental human right to put myself up. You, you can't do that. You, know, you, you, you can't do that, except, mm -hmm. except that you can put it in the constitution. But two, once two university degrees before you can... Once you put two university degrees there, indirectly, you are taking away those who have not, who are not less fortunate to go to universities from leading, and that is their fundamental right to lead. You cannot do that. Hmm. No, but the, the constitution says that you, you should be over forty before you run for, let's say, president. That's right. That but is in the constitution. Yeah, but, but people who are thirty-eight can't come and say, "Well, look, I'm thirty-eight, and two years now, I won't be wiser or any more foolish." So you're taking away my right, and therefore let me go and run. So once, once it's in the law, then it's in the law. It's in the law. So for the chief executive thing too, if you want to put two university degrees in there, put it in the constitution. But I can tell you that somebody will go to the Supreme Court and challenge it, and the person will, the person stands the chance of winning. There, there will be no way of limiting it. Yeah, the, the, the only way that you can limit it is going partisan. When you go partisan, they give the parties the opportunity to see if and come up with the best. So then they will do the necessary checks and balance. They will do the necessary screening to come up with the best candidate to represent them. That is the only way by which you can get the best candidate coming out to represent the political party as a chief, as a chief executive for a partisan election. I mean, it may sound silly, but it's my show, so I can ask a silly question. I mean, aptitude test. What, 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 well, you know, a really stiff aptitude. I mean, you are a governance expert, so you guys will put out an aptitude test and then they'll do it. Say, no, 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 this guy, you're not, you're not a leader or you can't be a DC if you can't answer these questions. And then you kick some out and read the no, no, You agree with me that election does not necessarily bring the most competent person. Mm. It brings the most popular person. Mm. And the most popular person may not necessarily be the most competent person to lead us. Mm -hmm. So if you go to maybe Krabukesi and there is this wise man there who has never been to school mm. but the man is bringing development he's, he's able to mobilize them he's able to talk to them for them to join him in communal labor don't you think this man can lead the local assembly yes he can he can but you know can, so but, but, but may not be able to do the aptitude test well he may not be able to do that so he, when, once you introduce the aptitude test i mean you you you, you take all these guys away and governance is about people. Democracy is about majority. It's a majoritarian principle. Mm. Majority carries the vote. You know, that is why we need to improve the quality of our electorate. If we improve the quality of your electorate, then you can get one of the quality electorate to represent them. If you don't improve the quality of your electorate, you will get, you, you will get the kind of leadership we are getting. It's, it's, it's not easy. It's not. That is why we need African type of democracy. 
We are implementing democracy as if the whole society is fully developed. The whole society can read and write like we have in advanced countries. There are certain things that we have imported wholesale and we have imported it blindly. We have no business importing them. Hmm. Some of, so, certain parts of our democracy. Because I, even in the royal sense, now, now you are a royal, you are a traditionalist, and it is not everybody who qualifies to become a chief. Yeah. There are criteria. You, you can come from the royal, royal family. family, but then if the elder sits and they think that, look, you cannot lead us, you can just not go. But in democracy, try it. Every, everybody goes. Everybody goes. Well, one, of, one of the questions I wanted to find out from you was that if uh, change can come based on the same system, and then you threw in this African democracy thing, should, should we go and look at these laws or these rules in order to affect the real change that we are looking for? That sometimes the system does not allow the sort of government that we are looking for. Because, I mean, with all these things, I mean, half the year is gone. In the next Definitely. four years, you know, you should be ready to leave office and go and try your luck again. Definitely. And if you look at the mess and all this confusion as to whether we vote, and it, it, it's, we don't allow enough time for long-term planning. Can true change come based on the system we are running? Uh, yes, it will, it, it will depend on how we work. It will depend on how we sensitize citizens. And it will depend on how we affect changes in the system itself. The system itself requires fundamental changes. Yes, I, so that's I, my question. Yes, that, you know, I, I mm -hmm. really want to believe that if we had imported wholesale the systems that exist at the traditional level mm -hmm. into our governance system would have been far, far better off than what we are doing now. I mean, we chiefs don't tell people what the traditional government is like. So it looks very chaotic from outside and people want to stay you know, far away from it because they, they look at it as if it's very, very authoritarian. But well, now there is some discipline and checks and balances there. Too many. The checks, <laughs> you, you can just not get up and do anything no, anyhow. No, you can't. Your attention will be drawn to it and mm. that's it. Mm. In a quiet way. <laughs> no, 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 you can't at all. And I was mm. finding that we were having a conversation and I said that, you know, as a chief, I have all the authority, but the power has been broken up into pieces and given to the sub-chiefs, if I may call it. So for me to do anything, depending on which ministry you need, you would have to call somebody from that ministry so that you can do it. And that's for them true. to do anything, they come and get the authority to do so. There's always that check and check balance, balance which people are not aware. Maybe we have to do an education on all that. But uh, we're still staying on the system. And I'm going to take a quick break and come back and still stay on the system and find out what do we do? Extend the uh, term of governance, reduce the powers of the president. What do we do so that we can get the real change that we want? Well, for true change to come, for true governance that we expect to come, you know, how much of the laws do we change? Doc, do we extend presidency and probably maybe reduce the powers of the presidency? The police fraternity will groom their own IGP fire service fraternity, will groom their own fire chief. You know, some of these fraternities will groom their own, you know, VRA will bring up their own CEO so that... People checks and balances. Do we need that? Or the African democracy should be that? No. Look, let the leader pick all these bits and pieces. You know, you make reference to. I mean, I I don't pick my ministers. My ministers are groomed from colleges. So whether they were there before me or I was there before them, whoever comes, you have to work with them because it's nobody's favorite. It's a college that has elected that minister. Ijasi, Sana, and Kobia has come from a, a college or a family. And whether you don't like him or not, he has to go from, came from the same family again. Will that sort of system work when you move into political systems or then it becomes a bit tricky? It becomes a bit tricky because of the system we've operated in the past. But if we want to deviate from the past to make sure that we can uh, integrate the current traditional systems into it, then we may end up reducing the powers of the president. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, we have three organs of government, and if you want checks and balances to work well, you should not allow one of the organs to be more powerful than the other. Mm -hmm. At the moment, you realize that because the president um, picks most of his ministers from parliament, mm -hmm. president or the executive, to some extent, have some control over parliament. Because they, they can be sure that once they submit a bill to parliament and they get their chief whip to whip the people in line, 
whether he will like it or not, the bill will be carried. Mm -hmm. So then to what extent that parliament, is a parliament able to exercise its powers? More to the point, these ministers who are also part of the executive would always find it difficult to criticize their own uh, decisions taken at the executive level. You know, and when you look at the judiciary, for instance, they are one of the organs of that may have been able to stand on their feet to some extent. But even with them, uh, it becomes a hell of time for them to be able to perform some of their functions. So I think that going forward, we need to reduce the powers of the president. We need to allow checks and balances to work uh, as required by uh, that particular checks and balances principle. However, we need to allow certain state institutions to be as independent as possible, mm -hmm. especially the security agencies. I'm looking forward to us having an IGP who will survive government, an IGP who can have security of tenure, an IGP who would be convinced beyond reasonable doubt that I'll be the professional IGP that I want to be. Government can come to power, government can go. I will stay until I hit 60, or I'll stay for eight years or 10 years. But his position should be in such a way that he will survive government. Mm -hmm. And then the leaders of the various public institutions, in that case, they work with the governance or a national mentality rather than working with political party mentality. And when a government wins power, the government must know that now they are government for everybody. We have they, they have all the human resources in Ghana at their disposal. Mm -hmm. They can go into any political party, pick anybody they think the person has the requisite skills to support and prosecute the agenda. Once we are able to think like that as a nation, mm -hmm. we'll give true meaning to the concept of one country with a common destiny. Look, it's been six strokes, seven months since a new government came into power, and everybody will say, "Look, Agroba if you have a power, if you know, if it's your semi, you should see it bubbling from underneath." Uh, I mean, what, what what can you say? You know, six strokes, seven months into this new administration. I think the the new administration is still putting structures in place. I mean, they they they, they are yet to be done with the appointments. Just yesterday I heard they have, give, they have appointed ambassadors, which means it is still work in progress, but they need to be very fast on it. Yeah, because there's no time. In the first year, if you waste the whole year putting the structures in place, the last year of, in the life of every government is campaigning. Mm. So technically you have two years to deliver. And looking at the promises they gave, they need to start working now. I would say that it is work in progress. It is early days yet mm -hmm. for us to draw conclusions. Even the government is yet to present its uh, economic policy or its uh, program of action, medium term plan to parliament for parliament to approve. You know? So I think all in all, I'll say that it is work in progress. Uh, they are putting the structures in place like any other institution, but the pace is very slow. They should be very fast at it. Else, if they waste the whole of the year putting the structures in place, they will end up working with, or within only two years. And that can affect the achievement of some of the promises they made to Ghanaians. Dr. you say it's slow. But then on the other hand, you know, people would say, look, it's the shortest time where all ministers have been picked, the shortest times where DCs have been placed, uh, shortest times where DCs are going for their orientation. orientation. You know, so many, you know, shortest time, shortest time, I mean, 110 ministers and they are all, you know, up and running. Uh, board, some of the boards have already been sworn in. So, on one hand, we are being told that, listen, uh, you know, he's working in a great hurry, as the president said. On the other hand, it's not, it doesn't seem to be fast enough. So, where's the balance? What's the actual... I, I think that by the end of the third quarter, the president should not be doing, should not be in the business of doing appointments again. Mm. By the end of the third quarter, which is by 30th September, the president should not be doing appointment again. So the president will then end the last quarter in working or on working with the plans and policies for 2018, 2019, etc. So yes, they are, they are, they, he is in a hurry, but I think he needs to work faster than he's working now. Is, is, is it possible? It, it is possible. The, the, I, I, I trust the president, and I know that he means business if he said he's in a hurry. But I think that it gets to a point where he is crippled by the law. Because even with the appointment of chief executives, for instance, you need to make sure that you revoke the government appointees, assembly members in the assembly, before you even initiate the process of appointing your chief executives. Else, the chief executives will get there and they will not be approved. <laughs> Aside from that, when you nominate the chief executive, you have to give room for rejections and renominations. And that is what has affected 
the nominations and then the appointment of chief executive. Mm -hmm. You know, so at certain times, you can be in a hurry as a person or as a president, but the laws may not allow you to work as fast as you want to be. That notwithstanding, that is why you are a leader. You think outside the box, you have an alternative plan B to be able to ensure that you are able to lay a very good foundation so your government can work towards delivering on all the promises given to Ghanaians. No, well, you, since you're here, I think you can't leave without commenting on Inisaf Husseini bagging his office and, 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 and leaving and just going to sleep as business as, as usual on the basis that, well, the bag did not work anyway. That, I think, is rather unfortunate. I mean, that shouldn't have happened in the first place. But uh, I was asking myself, well, for what reason did you do that? Now, even if he had done that and he was leaving, I was expecting him to make sure that he dismantled everything. Because you are given the opportunity to pack your things out. You are given the opportunity to prepare handing over notes. For some reason, if you have that thing there, I was expecting him to even put it in his handing over notes, except that he would say that this is an informal thing. It is his personal thing that he left there. But then, your personal thing that he left there, it was going to affect somebody's work. Aside from that, this thing was inbuilt in a, in, in, in a court of arms. And, you know, court of arms represents all of us. You know? So I think that it is something that he should apologize to all of us for doing that. And then he should explain to us that he doesn't mean any evil. It is something that should never be repeated by any leader again. Where Whichever office you occupy, remember one day you leave that office because it is a public office. When you are leaving, make sure that you prepare good handing over notes. You leave with things that are not attached to the position. So when are we going to get to a state where, you know, political heads and, you know, people in higher office just come and say, you know what, I messed up, that's my resignation letter, thank you very much, but I'm off. I think gradually we'll get there. Uh, we'll gradually, gradually we'll get there. It happened in President Mohammed's government. Mm. Yes, uh, gradually we'll get there. And, and I, I, I want to believe that current political leadership must take a cue from that. Uh, the principle of integrity must work. If you feel that you've messed up and uh, your integrity is at stake, be humble enough to resign. And I think you will not lose anything for doing that. So gradually we'll get there. But we, we read news of countries where a ship sets sail, captain goes and drowns the ship, and then the guy, minister in the office says, well, if the ship is drowned, then I'm off since my ministry, you know, this ship works under my ministry. Well, that's it. I'm going home. And I'm sure if they were to do an investigation, well, how could that have been your fault? But so far as it's under my ministry and I haven't checked him and checked that, checked that. I mean, uh, is it a sign of good governance? Is it necessary or maybe it's overstretching things? It's not overstretching things. It's a sign of good governance. It's a sign of personal responsibility. You see, as a leader, you say to yourself you are responsible for your own actions. And that makes you, that's the mark of a very good leader. You don't pass on blame to people. You accept responsibility. And that's what they are doing. I'm looking forward to most of, of our leaders accepting responsibilities for the actions and inactions of their subordinates. Or even actions and inactions of acti or activities within the administration. If we are able to get leaders like that, then we would, we would have arrived. But as of now, it is work in progress. Work in progress. Look, the, uh, they always say development will start from the assemblies. That's where development starts from. But till this day, the work of the assembly is still complete magic and strange to the people who are even closest to the assembly. But what should be done? How, how much more education? How should we do the education for people to know that, listen, you know, it's because of us that the assemblies are there. Because right now, some people think, well, we are there because the assemblies are there. You know, how do we reverse this thinking for us to know that, listen, the challenge is that we are not fully operationalizing the substructures, sub-district structures. Mm. So we are decentralizing, but then decentralized ends at the district assembly level. So that if you, if you have a, a municipality like Adenta, and then you decentralize and it gets to only Adenta, it is only the people within Adenta and its environs. Who knows the district assembly? Mm. But the zonal councils, the unit committees, and the area councils that are closer to the people have not been fully operationalized. Mm. And the normal circumstances, people have no business working to the office of the assembly to uh, apply for building permit. You should have a zonal council which is within your area and then apply there. The zonal council will take it to the main assembly's office. If it's ready, they'll bring it back to you there. The zonal council should be able to know houses that have not paid for their uh, property rates and then relay that information to them. The Zonal Council should be able to educate them. The Zonal Council should be able to work with the unit committees. But what do we see? Most of these unit committees are non-functional. 
Most of the zonal councils are not working. So the problem is with the substructures. If we are able to work very hard to operationalize the substructures, that is where people will feel governance. Now people still think that governance is far away from them because they have to go to the head office of the assembly. And you can imagine the kind of reception you will receive if you go to the offices of the assembly. So the solution is that as a nation, we should take it upon ourselves to deepen and operationalize the substructures. That is the lowest unit of governance that will bring governance closer to the people. And these substructures are the unit committees, the zonal council, the area council, and the submetros. The unit committees. Yes, the, the unit committees especially. Mm. Hmm, well, if any districts and uh, if you're listening, you have to definitely insist that you have a, a unit committee there because everything to do with government, they become your first uh, point. point of call. Uh, and you can feel governance too. But Doc, thank you very much for today's education. The questions haven't finished. And so one day we'll get Doc to come back in there. But the governance has become just a mirage. But I like the, uh, let's just Africanize our democracy so we can move on. To you at home, I always give you this number. It's 24 366 2001 That's Tanti's Fashions. They make my shirt for the show. Thank you very much, Doc, for coming. Thank you. And uh, we'll be back to do this all over again. Thank you very much. <laughs>